8 to 9 p.m., the Citizens Community Forum. Your host, Stephen Cummings. And welcome again to another edition of the Citizens Community Forum. Our objective is always to have an engaging and interactive as well as a civil discourse and in so doing help develop a culture of peace and understanding and uh, through a constructive dialogue and yes, a citizen's participation. Our guests are persons who express views and opinions of their own and sometimes may not necessarily be that of the FBI network, the Citizens Community Forum or that of the host. Our, Our topics, topics are also wide-ranging, wide discussions at times may be emotionally charged, but surely we can always find common ground and learn from each other, irrespective of differing views. Now, human reproductive health and uh, family life education are perhaps the two of the most important subject matters for life's ever-changing societies. And many will argue that the norms of 50 years ago are not the norms of 2021 especially when it comes to family life. But what has our education system done to ensure unitary and stronger, stronger societal family units? Uh, should there be a stronger push for greater levels of family life education, and especially targeted to young men and young women in schools and by extension our society? There is also a taboo that remains uh, when it comes to sex education among young people in schools. Uh, who should really be the teachers and or educators on the subject of uh, sexual uh, reproductive health and family life education? Should this be left up to the teachers or should it be the re uh, responsibility of parents uh, within the home or, uh, or rather to give that kind of um, guidance to children? Uh, still, uh, should it be a whole of society approach? Now. Viral videos of inappropriate behavior among young people in many of our public and private uh, school systems are not only cause for concern, but raises the question as to whether, as a society, we have been using the right tools or the right policies to respond. Well, uh, this evening, inside the Citizens Community Forum, our topic addressing the issues that plague family life and sex education among young people. And uh, also to uh, discuss um, the issue, joining me is Mrs. Rebecca Ali Guevara, uh, attorney at law, founder and executive director of the Alpis Center, a pregnancy and family resources center established in 2009. Um, they work with women in crisis, uh, mothers and children who are displaced and uh, provide teen risk avoidance uh, programs, family research and uh, training. Ms. Says Rebecca Ali Govaya, welcome to the Citizens Community Forum. Thank you, Stephen Cummings. Um, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here and looking forward to our discussion. Good evening to you and welcome. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here and look forward to our discussion. Yes, indeed. Well, you know, I wanted to start out the discussion this evening, uh, Ms. Govaya, by uh, you explaining. Now, I, I did touch a bit on it in my opening. Uh, just give us an idea. Uh, certainly, um, the center is, is should be more than just about counseling and and you know um, responding in that way to <laughs> to the crisis um, <laughs> affecting women and and by extension you know um, men and the society of Trinidad and Tobago. Tell us a bit uh, more about the center before we get into our discussion this evening. Okay, sure. I'm happy to do so. So, Elpis Center. The word Elpis um, is Greek for hope. 
and it's that hope that is a show expectant hope um and this is what we 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 um try to convey and to give to all our clients regardless as to which program they are they, they access so we were established in 2009 and you know there is a dr joseph Belazo who said hope is the bridge between the impossible and the possible mm. And so in all our programs, what we seek to do is move our clients, whether they are women or families or single mothers in crisis um, or displaced or in need of counseling or our teens and parents, we try to move them from what they might think is an impossibility to a possibility. So um, when we started off in 2009, we, we started working with women who were in various crises, for instance, maybe a pregnancy crisis, uh, maybe a relationship crisis or traumas from their childhood that's now impacting um, their lives in different ways. And then we we grew from there um, based on the issues that we were seeing to providing what we call transitional housing. So this is very different to emergency housing in that our housing goes from two weeks to two years. And the goal of our housing program is to support um, single headed families, um, in moving from, um, displacement and lack and not being able to meet their basic needs to being self-reliant and self-sufficient. And so depending on the family circumstance that can take anywhere from three months to two years, sometimes even longer. So that, that is what we call supportive transitional housing. Um, the other dimension of our work, you know, I don't know if you, 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 you heard this statement recently, but, you know, there is a saying that an ounce of prevention mm. <laughs> is better than, <laughs> is better than a pound of cure. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, back in 2014, after, after doing responsive work for all those years, we said, you know what, we need to get ahead. Mm -hmm. of what's happening we need to yes. we need to prevent ahead of the curve yes yeah <laughs> we need to prevent and so in collaboration with dr coppola who um wrote the suite of programs that we use and we we, we connected way back in 2010 but in 2014 we began using her teen risk avoidance curriculum and the goal of that curriculum is to equip our young people to stay on a path of optimal youth health development, right? Where they can achieve their goals, where they can follow what we call a success sequence. And we can talk more about that later mm -hmm. and ensure as far as possible that they can avoid poverty, avoid displacement, avoid abuse and other types of trauma, and just follow a path to, to, to accomplishing their goals. So we've been doing that since, um, 2014 and, um, you know, that, that is, that is occupying a big part of our work in the past two years, because we're seeing an increasing need yes. and, and we don't just work with teens. I just want to say our program has a parent component and it has an educator component. Right. But I'm, I'm sure we're going to be talking uh, much more about that um, during the program uh, this evening, yeah. uh, Mrs. Uh, Gubaya. But, you know, we just want to just re remind um, our listeners that uh, this is the Citizens Community Forum. I'm Stephen Cummings and our topic this evening, addressing the issues that plague family life and sex education among young people. And I have with me Mrs. Uh, Rebecca Ali Gubaya of the Alpha Center, a pregnancy and a family resource center established in 2009. They work with women in crisis, mothers and children who are displaced and provide a teen risk avoidance the programs, family research and um, training. Mrs. Govai, we, we have been, what, um, almost two years um, into a pandemic. And I wanted to just get an, uh, an idea as to what has been, how you have been able to manage as, as a center, as an organization. Of course, um, uh, the rules of the game, you know, have changed for a lot of organizations. Right. Uh, we've been doing um, virtuals, we've been doing non-contact uh, you know, sessions. Um, I've even seen, you know, um, 
sports, um, you know, events being held, rallies being held, you know, <laughs> via, via the virtual medium. And of course, you know, your organization, what you are involved in, um, demands that there be that kind of human touch, as it were, um, if, uh, you know, to use that, that ex expression in terms of counseling and dealing with uh, issues in the society. Um, how, has, you know, how have you really been able to, uh, to, to guide, you know, um, persons and, and of course, you know, the strategic, strategic direction of the, of the organization through um, this period, through this pandemic in Trinidad and Tobago? Good question. <laughs> um, truthfully, we, we have probably worked harder rather than, um, worked more rather than less in mm. the last couple of years. Um, one of the, what, through the pandemic specifically, I mean, one of the reasons being that more families were hit with displacement and crisis during the season. We're talking everything from abuse to relationship issues, relationship breakdown, loss of um, job, um, loss of evictions. I mean, you know, um, and not just single-headed families, but families in general. So what we, so, so our clientele has not reduced. It has actually increased, but we've employed multiple strategies. For instance, we we do virtual counseling, actually. Hmm. Um, we do. So our clinical psychologist has a confidential virtual platform that she uses. And, you know, I'd have to say, Stephen, I think that may have assisted in the increase in clients that we got, mm -hmm. which oh. means that women were able to access very necessary mental health interventions without leaving their homes, um, just using their phone. And once, once our, we have a client who we do a need assessment for, and she's deemed to be in need, meaning we pay for the cost of the counseling. Mm -hmm. um, there's no cost to her. It's literally jumping on her phone mm -hmm. once there's Wi-Fi access and getting help. So I have found that there's been an increase in the number of women coming for counseling because we went virtual to oh. a large extent. All right. So, so the pandemic has not been so much of uh, a negative um, as far as your operation, as far as the operational side of your organization is concerned. No, no. We, I mean, we opened, we opened a new transitional housing in this year. Mm -hmm. All right. You know, so. All right. Well, well, I think, you know, um, uh, there are lots of organizations uh, I know that are under um, some extreme, extreme, you know, difficult, um, under an extreme difficult period and, and you know, have been for um, almost uh, two years, you know, having to um, contend with uh, public health restrictions and all that, you know, have gone with the uh, pandemic uh, in, in Trinidad and Tobago. But, uh, you know, in continuing our discussion, uh, Ms. Um, Gavaya, we're talking, as I said, you know, addressing the issues that plague family life and sex education among young people, and and, and I, I wanted to sort of uh, I want us to sort of drill a little further um, on this, but you know, I want to ask the question: um, Who should really be the teachers and or educators on uh, the subject of sexual reproductive health and family life education? Um, should uh, you know because you know there are many schools of thought that maybe um, it should be left up to the teachers. Uh, it should be left up to the parents within the home. It should be a combination of school, parents, civil society, and, and organizations such as, you know, the ones that, that you lead. Yes. Good question. And I'd say it depends on who you ask. Mm. Um, our perspective, however, is that we believe, and the evidence shows, right, that if our young people get, get a risk avoidance, message from more than one source mm. what it does is it, it's like a reiteration it reinforces it it um sends the message to them very clearly and very strongly that this is the healthiest um choice for you yeah, but let me yeah, so, I, would, I would allow you to develop that point further because why i ask the question is that in the in this uh what i would call maybe a, a, a three prong approach in terms of the response um, you can very well have uh, different messages being sent and different signaling, um, you know, so that that may not necessarily lend itself to what I would call a seamless approach in terms of uh, the response. Right. So there was a survey done um, some years ago where parents themselves has, have said 
that they prefer to be the ones that communicate um, the sex education message to their children, the greater percent. And this was across demographics, meaning regardless of political views, ethnicity, or, or, or income grouping. Um, the teens, teens say that the, the people they rely on to get their message on this issue would be their parents and their teachers. So in the, in the, in the eyes or the minds of our children, our youth, these two people, these two groups are the trusted adults in their lives. Mm. And so these are the, the people that they want to get the message from. Um, so we'll come back to what the message should be, mm. but I'm just addressing, you know, which grouping. Yes. Where, where, where church and community groups come in, because I don't believe they should be left out of the equation. I believe they are a very important mm -hmm. source of messaging as well. And so if the parent and the school and the community or church um, uh, source are sending the same message, that's the ideal. Mm -hmm. If yeah, but the message is, not, is conflicting, life is not as, life is not as linear um, as that, uh, Doctor. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right, right? But if this, if the message if the message is conflicting, yeah. if the message is conflicting, then what parents are saying is that I want to be my message needs to be the most important message, hmm. and the teens are saying what my parents and teachers tell me would be carry more weight for me. So, so if I were to, if I were to say, um, to the parents that are listening, we would encourage you to be armed with the best information, the best evidence-based information so that you can be your child's best teacher on the issue of sexuality. Mm. All right, I, I hear you, uh, Dr. Rubaya. And, uh, this is the Citizens Community Forum. I'm Stephen Cummings. Uh, our topic this evening, addressing the issues that plague family life and sex education among young people. And I have with me Mrs. Uh, Rebecca Ali Rubaya. And of course, um, uh, you know, from the uh, Elpis Center, uh, we are discussing this very, very important um, uh, subject matter. Um, an organization that uh, she leads, uh, talking about um, this, you know, responding, as, as, as I said, responding to um, this uh, social issue. Um, some may describe it as, as a crisis, um, but all the same, um, something that needs to be responded to. Now, the Center mm -hmm. for Disease Control and Prevention Division of uh, Adolescent and School Health um, established, I was looking at um, uh, some information, established an evidence-based um, approach, um, you know, schools, um, uh, saying that schools can implement to help prevent um, HIV, STDs, uh, STDs and um, unintended um, pregnancy among adolescents. And it concludes quality education, uh, health education um, systems that connect students to health services and safer and more supportive school environments. Uh, do we have such a system in Trinidad and Tobago, as far as you know, um, Skovai? Um. So I know that the health and family life education curriculum has been in the schools for, for years. Um, I'm aware that the Catholic primary schools, for instance, they teach a program called Alive to the World, mm -hmm. which is a character um, uh, and virtues development program for children in their primary school grouping. Um, the high schools, the secondary schools in Trinidad and Tobago at one point introduced a book from the Macmillan series on HFLE, mm. but there has not been um, agreement on, on some of the content or some of the issues or even whether it should be taught or how it should be taught or what should be taught. And, you know, just to be just to be, I guess, frank with the people listening in, what I have observed is that in the last year or so, there's been an increased call by certain sectors of our society asking for the Ministry of Education to be more robust in its implementation of the HFLE, and in particular to implement a comprehensive approach. And so I just, I, you know, what we want, um, persons to examine and understand is or to ask what exactly is the comprehensive approach hmm. 
And is that going to achieve the best outcome, the best outcomes for our young people? So having an outcome is one thing, but having the best outcome mm. is another thing. So, yeah, go ahead. But very interesting point. And, and, you know, it leads me to, to also ask, um, uh, Mr. Kavaya, when it comes to the school system, what should, you know, what should our approach be regarding uh, age appropriateness um, in dealing with human reproductive uh, health and family life education? Because you are dealing with uh, yes. developmental stages of learning. Um, should it start at the primary, secondary? Where should it start? Very, very good question. So I want to direct people to a website if you can get this down. It's called the Medical Institute for Sexual Health. And my colleague, Laurie Kukendall, was supposed to be on this call tonight to talk a bit about this, but she wasn't able to make it due to I'm family sure we'll emergency. An, I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to chat with her yes. at a future date, but, but go ahead, yes. So, so this institute, um, they, they, in June of this year, actually, they issued a body of standards. So there is a difference between a curriculum and a standard, okay? Mm. The standard would be like the umbrella or, or the, um, that more overarching, sorry, overarching um, guidance as to what should be taught. Curriculums would be, you know, okay, I'm going to teach this content, this content in this way using this tool. So anybody wanting to understand very clearly what is the optimal approach to, to teaching or approaching the sexual development of children need to go to this website and download their standards. You can download it. Yes, give us the name of that um, that website again. Um, Medical Institute for Sexual Health. Mm -hmm. I could probably send it to you in the chat. And you'll see it says K to 12 standards for optimal sexual development. Okay. Right, but the uh, institute the is medical. Our, our, yeah, just for the benefit of our listeners. And, uh, yes. Um, so just so so here's the thing. In children that are younger, you do not teach sex education. You teach character development. You teach mm -hmm. values and virtues. You teach self-esteem and self-efficacy. As children get older, and and just to, I mean we can. Their, their standard lays it out very clearly from year to year, year by year, year by year. Hmm. But just broadly for, for people to understand, you don't, you don't go into sexuality issues until your children are, are at puberty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So unfortunately, some of what you may find in a comprehensive approach is that they expose children too early the curriculums that are used under that that banner mm -hmm. expose children too early to concepts that they don't need to be be exposed to it will not aid in optimal sexual development um also the medical institute of sexual health when they built those standards the 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 underlying philosophy beneath those standards is what we call risk avoidance okay. or sexual risk avoidance as opposed to comprehensive sexuality education or what some people might be calling comprehensive hfle hmm. okay mm -hmm. so so to the listeners out there you need to be very in tune and, and ask yourself the questions like steven is asking what exactly is the standard hmm. that should be applied and then what is the philosophy or model that we should be using. And I am, I'm submitting to the listeners that the model, the best model for our children is sexual risk avoidance and risk cessation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So not just risk avoidance, but risk cessation. Mm -hmm. All right. Because, you know, there is also the argument uh, that um, children develop, you know, they develop at, at, uh, differently. Um, in, at different levels, um, you know, you might find that let's, for, for example, an eight year old, some people tell you, you know, would display the mind of um, someone who is maybe 15, 16, and um, you can have the, the, the reverse uh, happening as well. So that, you know, there's always that, um, that discussion uh, and, and that confusion in the minds of, of people as to where should we start? And, and I did reference, you know, the, the, the age appropriateness, you know, how and, and how should we treat with that? 
So, so here's the thing. In any situation, you may have outliers, okay? Um, you know, in looking at data and analyzing any demographics or any issue, there'll be outliers. However, um, we need to ask and answer the question, are we prepared as a society collectively, as a community, as, as church or faith-based community, or um, just people seeking the common good, mm -hmm. right? Are we prepared to set the highest standards for our children and our youth and our parents and bring them along? Or mm. are we going to just allow things to roll at random without any intervention? Because one of the things that research has shown is that children who grow up in homes or communities where standards are low or not communicated or put another way, where they are exposed to a lot of risky um, type behaviors, you know what's going to happen? They are going to naturally gravitate based on what's being modeled. Yes, what, they, the messages. what they are seeing around them. Yes, yes mm -hmm. right? Without an understanding of why, because children cognitively are not able to ask and answer the questions that an adult would answer. Mm. Children tend to imitate. So it, there are some communities where um children are exposed to behaviors at a different age, as you pointed out, than in other communities. Mm -hmm. But here's the question. Are we really okay with that? Are we saying that that's okay? Or are we, are we willing to say that we want to help every child or every youth in Trinidad and Tobago to, to get an optimal health message, which is what El Center's goal is. Our, we, 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 have, we, we have passionately worked towards this and on this program because we believe that every child and every youth in Trinidad and Tobago is capable, is bright, um, deserves to be treated with respect, deserves to live with dignity, and deserves to be given the best possible health message. If we drop the standards for our children, they will follow it. If we raise the standards for our children, I'm telling you, they will they will rise to it. And even even the American College of Pediatricians issued a statement supporting mm. sexual risk avoidance as the best model for children. Mm -hmm. But one of the things they said was, you don't lose anything in, in teaching a sexual risk avoidance and risk cessation model. Nothing is lost if you have to help a teen who may already be exposed, mm -hmm. may already be involved, whether it's through coercion or otherwise in intimate relations, and needs access to contraceptive or needs access to medical advice. That medical doctor can still intervene in that particular case to safeguard that child's health. Mm -hmm. But asking that youth, are you willing to pursue or consider an optimal health approach? Mm. All right. So Sorry. while moving, you know, while transitioning that youth or that child from where they are to where they ought to be for their best health, a medical doctor can still provide services on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. All right. So that there is still uh, that opportunity for that very important and critical intervention. Yeah. On a case by case basis, but to normalize teen um, re sexual relations to normalize that and to reduce that to, to very, very young kids is going to be hmm. a precipice. I don't think we want to go over. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, this is the Citizens Community Forum. I'm Stephen Cummings. Our topic this evening addressing the issues that plague uh, family life and sex education among uh, young people. I have with me Mrs. Uh, Rebecca Ali Govaya of the Elpis Center. A pregnancy and a family resources center established in 2009 at the work with the women in crisis, mothers and children who are displaced and provide teen risk avoidance programs, family research and training. Ms. Zavaya, we have to take a short break now and sure. when we come back, we will continue the discussion. No problem. Thank you.
Be part of the Citizens Community Forum, a place where we bring to light and discuss critical community, social and national issues. Discussions on health, leadership, governance, crime, education and social justice. We, we might shift from focusing on whole language approaches to focusing on developing phonemic awareness. So we're just teaching phonics and then the role of comprehension in the vocabulary development, making sure students can visualize when they read. We're not addressing those needs. So you're right. And, and as a matter of fact, I don't know, Stephen, if you know this, but there are some places in the States where the drinking age is, the legal drinking age is 21 and not 18. Even though there are persons advocating for our age of consent to be dropped back to 16. You are dealing with uh, developmental stages of learning. Um, should it start at the primary, secondary, where should it start? Very, very good question. So there are studies that are being done. The thing about it, Mr. Cummins, let's be honest, how many people really sit and read those studies or mm. even, I mean, a lot of things are coming in different forms. A lot yeah. of the, the data, a lot of the research is coming in video forms and so on. In our own society, how has research been articulated on this pandemic? Every Wednesday, 8 to 9 p.m., the Citizens Community Forum, your host, Stephen Cummings. And welcome back to the Citizens Community Forum. I'm Stephen Cummings. Uh, we are discussing this evening the topic addressing the issues that plague family life and sex education among young people. And I have with me Mrs. Rebecca Ali Guevara of the Elpis Center. Uh, pregnancy and Family Resource Center established in 2009. They work with women in crisis, mothers and children who are displaced, and uh, provide teen risk avoidance programs, family research and training. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Kvaya, welcome back. Thank you. Now, I have, you know, I've heard, heard it said uh, that uh, to successfully put a quality reproductive health and family life education system in place, uh, um, or into practice more specifically. Schools need to, uh, or rather need supportive policies, appropriate content, uh, train staff, and engage parents and communities. Are these some of the pillars, um, you know, that could see us easing out of uh, what I would describe as this uh, human face crisis um, when it comes to addressing such family life uh, issues? Um, just to clarify, what do you mean by human face crisis? The, the, the problem where um, we, we, do, we do have a problem here, not, not in just in Trinidad and Tobago, but globally, where we see viral videos, we see families, the fabric of this, the, the, the society, um, just, you know, um, falling victims to different kinds of ills. Um, you know, and the question is, you know, do we need to have, let's say, more of a comprehensive um, response plan? All right. So um, I wanted to, in answering that question, probably to just contextualize what exactly we're going after. I want to say this, mm -hmm. that our teenagers as, and, and, and perhaps parents may have become more attuned, as, attuned or in tune to this because of the pandemic. Our kids now are overwhelmingly exposed to hypersexualized content, mm -hmm. both online and both offline, whether it's in their communities, homes, et cetera, et cetera. What exactly is this doing? <laughs> mm -hmm. So this, this is having an, a, a, a major impact on our young people, right? It, it's, and what we are, what we are appealing to policymakers, to parents, community leaders, etc., is to bring back into focus what is optimal health for our kids. When we talk about optimal health, what we are referring to is that child's physical health, mm. emotional health, social health, and spiritual health. Mm. If children are exposed to what is called comprehensive HFLE or even reproductive health, which is a bit of a 
a term that has to be carefully examined because it could mean yes. <laughs> it could mean many things yes right depending on whose definition you're yes. using uh, which side of the yeah the social right. uh, strata that that you are yes mm -hmm. right the the fa and i want to just take a minute to explain to yes, the public please do. That, please do. that if this this model of comprehensive hfle or comprehensive sex ed or reproductive health rights comprehensive sex ed means what it is is a rights-based approach to sex ed hmm. okay what it means is that the, the the angle that 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 comes from is that children are sexual beings from birth or human beings are sexual beings from birth and entitled pretty much like a fundamental human right which is not correct because it is not enshrined anywhere as a fundamental human right hmm. but in any event um that 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 this right to to sexuality and to express sexuality at any stage in any way um without um parental guidance and without um adherence to any cultural or religious norms values etc is what the is what that model of sexuality education teaches it's rights based it's anchored in my right Hmm. to express myself what the reality is what we would be actually saying to our kids it's what we call um the soft bigotry of low expectations hmm. okay hmm. what we're saying to our kids is we don't believe that you can pursue the best health opportunities for yourself so here's what just take this as a second alternative but what what is found is that children or youth who begin um who do not delay who do not delay sexual activity until they are in what we call a mutually monogamous long-term relationship otherwise known as marriage mm -hmm. this is what happens they are more likely to experience poorer health outcomes more likely to experience partner violence more likely to experience depression and suicide suicidal thoughts and behaviors more likely to have lower academic achievement lower educational attainment lower financial stability higher future infidelity and i want people to take note of that mm. higher rates of unstable marriages and divorce I want to remind us that a nation is only as strong as its families. Hmm. The family remains the core and fundamental group unit of society entitled entitled eh, to hmm. protection by both the state and society that is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights article 16. So the, the point I'm making is that if we are to put sex education into our schools we have to really contemplate what are the standards we're going to use yes what is the model philosophy how is this thing going to be ruled out how are we going to include our parents can i say that any model or any attempts to introduce sex ed into our schools that does not engage our parents is questionable right so there has to be a whole of society approach and in, including parents uh, as as important um you know elements in in that um in any move towards um treating with that absolutely parents are i would say the foremost group of people that need to be consulted because parents in law and in and in nature and in nature right because i i i appreciate that there are parents that need more support mm -hmm. than others okay yes. no problem with that however by and large parents have the natural right to to safeguard their children and and i would say responsibility so one of the things we advocate very strongly at elpis center is that as a parent you need to understand both your rights and your responsibility and take it very seriously and access any help and support to be the best possible parent you can be but parents still hmm. in law and in nature are the ones that are to decide what their children are to learn yes not just content but the manner in which it is taught 
Right. And I think sometimes as parents, we, we forget that we are, um, we are to be active partners with schools and with tutors, even if it's private lessons, even if it's online learning, we are to be active partners in what our children um, are learning. But, but certainly um, we have uh, here in Trinidad and Tobago uh, via um, lots of um, PTAs and you know, parent-teacher bodies. Um, are you saying that, that um, maybe there needs to be a greater focus um, where those groups are concerned to, um, to sort of push that envelope further to uh, bring you know, all of those elements together? Because you did mention um, the importance of parents um, having um, you know, an integral role to play as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'd go as far as to say that any sex ed program has to be an opt-in program, meaning it cannot be mandatory mm -hmm. and parents are to be consulted and be told what is going to be taught, what methods are going to be used, etc., and mm -hmm. opt their child into that program. All right. As for the PTAs and so on, um, you know, Stephen, the reality is many parents are really just trying to survive from day to day, hmm. you know, pay their bills, keep a roof over their head, food on the table, um, and even more so during the pandemic. Hmm. And I believe that this sort of fracturing that I observe happening between educators and parents need to be examined. Hmm. Okay. And there appears to be a widening gap. Um, yes. yes, there is. There is a widening gap. And, you know, in fairness to both sides, I think there's just a, a measure of frustration in the sense that, you know, teachers are educators and principals and maybe even the Ministry of Education is under pressure, so to speak, mm. to churn out um, whole citizens. Okay. All right. Okay. I, I hear you. I hear you in, in that. And, and then parents themselves want whole citizens. Mm. Okay. But, but how but do we challenge? Yeah, but maybe challenged because of right. maybe where where they sit economically. As you right. said, you know, you did you did mention that you know parents are burdened. Many parents are burdened with having to ensure that there is a roof over over you know their heads and, and there is yes. you know food and, and um, clothing and that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. And and naturally, parents tend to trust that the school or the ministries of education and other stakeholders will not bring to their children. Um, knowingly, any content that would be harmful. But I'm saying to parents that you need to be really diligent and ask the questions because um, a lot of times, even policymakers don't know what is being presented to them. And, and that's, as, that's, fri that's frightening, uh, Mrs. Govaya. Um, I, that's, um, I believe, <laughs> something that um, we can talk about further. But but that point um, that you you mentioned about even policymakers not you know having um that, that, that's a very fright, frightening point but you know we don't want to sort of uh, you know uh, to divert too much from the the topic of uh, our discussion this evening and uh, this is the citizens community forum i'm stephen cummings uh, we are discussing addressing the issues that plague family life and sex education among young people and i have with me this is rebecca ali Guvaya of the elpis center a pregnancy and a family resource center established in 2009. They work with women in crisis, mothers and children who are displaced, and provide teen risk avoidance programs, family research and training. Mr. Gopal, uh, how much blame is there to be placed on, let's say, mainstream and social media for helping to fuel this, uh, you know, I, I keep calling it a crisis, you know, among young people with respect to, you know, family life and, and, and sex education. Uh, you know, we, we have always been, you know, at that edge where um, it's difficult. And you, you mentioned it, um, you know, we can't be policemen and police women, um, you know, looking and watching our, over our children. Um, the Internet is, 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 is there, um, it has been there for, for a while and will be there for quite some time. And it, it, it opens up a, a whole new uh, spectrum in terms of not just positive learning, but also um, aspects of, 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 of negative learning, as, as it were. Yes. Yes, it is, a, it is a minefield now that parents and trusted adults have to navigate with their young people. And I just want to encourage parents that while it may appear overwhelming, 
um, there are definitely strategies that you can take to at least mitigate some of the impact that that would have. Um, and I mean, there are practical things like defining how many, how much screen time you're going to have, um, for your children, setting boundaries, um, putting filters, um, on, on devices. Um, not having children have their own computers and their room under a certain age. And unlocking the, the doors, yeah. yes, yes. Yes, so that, yeah. So that you, you, you're saying that there should be an open door policy. I think I saw, there was a, a movie I saw some time ago where um, there was a parent, um, you know, having these very same kinds of challenges. And um, one of the rules was that, um, you know, you, you're given all the amenities. You're given a computer and you're given what have you. But... Um, you can't lock the door. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And, you know, you know, there has to be a discussion with children around social media. Um, there are some children just, just, at some ages that just not have access to certain mm -hmm. platforms. I don't want to mention them, but I mean, you know, you all can think about that. Um, you need to, as parents, to understand which ones that, that, that are loaded with different predatory um, content and and people who can prey on your children so yes we we are in a different type of season it, it, it is a minefield but it is not impossible to navigate remember what we say hope bridges the impossible to the possible mm. so as parents i want us to be infused with hope about how we can dialogue with our, our children one of the main things that i you know want to impress upon parents is to keep the lines of communication open with your children at all ages you be the one to talk to them about these matters do not just assume that they are bright and will know what to do even pornography you know they, they are very like protect young minds they have very good materials online um that parents can access to, to use for children they've they they came out with a book called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures for Very Young Children. There are tools now that are very age appropriate, very um, you know well done and well researched and evidence based that as parents we can access to help our, our, our kids um, manage some of that, and we need to. But um, throwing our hands up in the air and saying, well, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, this is a new time. And, you it's know, it's um, not, not the approach. That, and yeah. everybody's just doing whatever they want. So my kids will just do whatever they want and they'll be fine. Mm -hmm. I just want to tell us they will not be fine. Mm -hmm. There is a path that will give them the best chance at having healthy relationships in the future. The, the whole idea of sexual risk avoidance is not something we pulled out of a hat. Hmm. It is a public health approach. Um, take, for instance, smoking. Okay. Would we give a pack of cigarettes to our 14 year old and say, well, here's a pack of cigarettes, but only use one a month? Hmm. Okay. So it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Just like alcohol, it's everywhere. But would we take our six year old, seven, nine, 10, 11, 12, and say, here, this is alcohol, this is what it's for, but use it once a month, use it once a year. You, you get what I'm saying? Yes, yeah, certainly, certainly. So it's the same thing with our children's sexual development. We cannot just leave it to random mm -hmm. um, people or social media or even the state to determine what is best for our children? We've got to find our voice on oh. on this matter. All right, um, certainly. And uh, this is the Citizens Community Forum. Um, Stephen Cummings, our topic this evening, addressing the issues of that uh, plague family life and sex education among young people. And I have with me, this is uh, Rebecca Ali Cabrera of the Alpes Center. And again, a pregnancy and family resource center established in 2009. They work with women in crisis, uh, mothers and children who are displaced and provides uh, right, a teen risk avoidance programs, family research and training. Mr. Gabay, I want to go back to that issue of um, culture and uh, the issue of uh, clashing cultures. Um, we do have a debate on um, 
you know, uh, and have had, you know, debates on, for example, the business of, uh, or the issue, I should say, of child marriages, and, and even right here in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, different cultures, you know, different um, people see having different perspectives. How, how, how dangerous is that, um, you know, when, when, we, when we discuss and, and, we, and we look at, um, you know, this particular subject matter, um, what are your, uh, you know, what are your perspectives on on that? Because as I said, uh, we, we it's, it's it has been an open debate, and, and it's something that uh, you know that, that we have been discussing, um, not just here in Trinidad and Tobago, but I'm sure the discussion has also been in the wider uh, wider world and the wider community. So there are two aspects to that. One is that Trinidad and Tobago did in fact do the right thing mm -hmm. when the Children's Authority, um, when the Children's Act was was put into place. Yes. And we increased the age of consent from 16 to 18. 18 yes. mm -hmm. And then we increased or we leveled the age of marriage to 18 across the board. Okay. So that has changed in Trinidad and Tobago. And I absolutely believe it was the correct thing to do. Um, you know, the truth is, and I know we can't do this, okay, but I'm just saying, if, if we understood brain development in the adolescents, which says Jay Geed is a, is a man who did tremendous research on the adolescent brain. And one of the things that neuroscientists are saying hmm. is that the teen brain is not developed until mid twenties, mid twenties, Twen yeah. 25 on the minimal end. That's, that's way into adulthood. Based Thank you. On our and 28 yeah. and, and wait, in the females, it actually develops earlier. So females might be 25 males, 27, 28. Hmm. And one of the things that neuroscientists are saying is that you need to be your child's prefrontal cortex mm. and help with the judgment, reasoning, and connecting decisions to consequences well into their 20s. There's a reason why insurance companies have high insurance for 21 and under. Mm -hmm. Because the, 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 the amount of risk-taking yes, that it's adolescent... A risk risk-based assessment. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm saying, I'm saying that to say, if it were up to me, I'd probably say the age should be 21, oh. <laughs> right? <laughs> but it is what it is. And, and, and as a matter of fact, I don't know, Stephen, if you know this, but there are some places in the States where the drinking age is, the legal drinking age is 21 and not 18. Mm. Okay. So the thing is, um, our laws are in a better place now. And they should stay that way, even though there are persons advocating for our age of consent to be dropped back to 16. Mm. And so it begs the question, why, if we increased the age of marriage or we leveled marriage to 18, so we don't have, you know, child marriage or not encouraging child marriages anymore, mm. why are we wanting to drop the age of consent back to 16? Mm. What happens between 16 and 18? Yes. It means the message you are sending Mm. is that teen sexual activity is okay but the truth is it's not mm. and it's not just stis and unintended pregnancies and so on mm. it is heartbreak mm -hmm. teenagers do not have the capacity to engage in long in in, in the criteria for a lot um healthy relationship formation mm. they, they aren't there yet cognitively Okay. If you, if you look at, if you look at the research on what are the components of a healthy long-term relationship, teens are unable to do most of it. And so what you find in teenagers is they, they engage in quick, short-term type relationships. So, you know, one month, two month, three month breakup. Mm. You, you know what I mean? And what, what is happening is that there, there's data to show that in, in places where this comprehensive or rights-based, contraceptive-based sex ed is taught, even where teen pregnancy might go down, you know what's ha what happened? STIs went up. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right, because, you know, as you mentioned that, uh, Mrs. Gavai, I'm, I'm wondering whether, you know, in Trinidad and Tobago and maybe in, in the wider region, um, the Caribbean, uh, other countries, that, that we have you know, the kinds of real-time data that would drive policy. Of course, you know, um, 
we are a changing society and uh, our policies certainly would have to keep up with the changing you know times the changing environment um, is there um, you know is, is there that that resource base um, in terms of research um, and, and have we been been, been keeping a, a, a pace with um, what's been happening um, in, in, the, in the society as we reference you know uh, family life and, and sex education among young, young people so regrettably we don't we aren't a data-driven region uh, generally speaking hmm. um, but but there is some data but from a few years ago and actually we are in the process of pulling some of that together right now hmm. um, in the US though one of the things that the CDC found is that one in every 14 between the ages of 15 to 24 would have contracted at least one STI or would have had some sort of sexual contact yes well, uh, well, not just sexual it's, contact, yeah. mm -hmm. but actually contracted an STI, like mm -hmm. one in four. And when when we did some preliminary examination of trends in, in, in the region, some in Trinidad and Tobago in particular, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, the trend seemed to be bending the same way mm -hmm. in our region. In, in terms of HIV AIDS, um, there is some data to show that that 15 to 24 age group the the most or the highest number of new cases is coming out of that age group mm. and this is why i'm saying we have got to get back to, or not get back but but we are here to explain that there is a way to teach this optimal youth health approach using the public health um, approach of primary prevention mm. which is called risk avoidance right and in particular, we offer a curriculum called Healthy Respect. So if there are groups out there and you say, look, you know, this sounds like something I want to give access to my community youth group or, 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 or um, school youth. If anybody listening to me has access to any gathering of young people, we are more than happy to help you get right. the healthy to, respect right to, to, to make that today. intervention because why i mentioned uh, research and and we ought to be always research driven which um is a pillar uh, or the foundation for policy um going forward but even um during this past what almost two years uh mrs Kovai, we've had what um we've had several lockdowns and of course you know you would hear um even some horror stories within the homes and of course yes. you, you where you sit um you would have um, you, you you get the, the information firsthand um yes. and and you know i'm not sure if we have the kinds of information and data for example what has happened over the past um 19 months or almost two years where you have had uh children and, and homes and, and being violated and what kinds of you know what what what, what kinds of issues um they would have um been been you know experiencing i i i don't know that we have in as much data as we ought to have hmm. but I think it's fair to say that there has been a mixed bag coming out of the COVID. There ha there's been positives and there's been negatives. And children in particular, um, mental health issues have increased. Certainly, yes. yes. Um, physical um, health and well-being issues have increased. Um, access to pornography has probably, I would, I, I would surmise, has increased. And so we need to join forces and, and, and now is a good time to, to really bring this youth development um, program to our children. Because I just want to say, I've been working with teens firsthand for years. And do you know what they tell me every single time, every single class, almost every single teen? You know what they tell me? Miss, this is the best class I have ever done. Hmm. This changes my life. This changes my perspective. I am going to commit to a risk avoidance lifestyle to accomplish my goals. And, and I want people to understand that sexual, sexual um, activity isn't a standalone issue. Eh? Mm. It becomes interconnected or what we call clustered with other risky behaviors. Yes, there, there so, are so many moving parts. Uh, Ms. Ms. Yeah. Mm. So for instance, a teen who's heartbroken over a lost relationship might go drink some alcohol. Fall, yes, fall victim. Or, to, or, or victim use behavior. alcohol yes. and marijuana or tobacco in, in, the, in the context of that relationship. And then that, th there is violence and there is 
So, so there are in there are clustering high risk behaviors. Right, that, and we need a multidisciplinary approach. Um, is is that what I'm hearing uh, in terms of the response? Well, okay. So two things: the curriculum that we use, which is evidence based, and there are others out there, touches on all of it. If if mm. your child does the curriculum with us, we touch on all of it. In terms of multidisciplinary, yes, I think that. Um, stakeholders need to come together, medical doctors, psychologists, um, educators, parent representatives. Civil society, um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you're welcome to call us if you, if you okay. are from any of these fields. <laughs> okay. Okay. Just, um, just putting a, a plug there uh, for the center. <laughs> okay. This is the Citizens Community Forum. I'm Stephen Cummings. Our topic this evening addressing the issues that fla uh, plague family life and uh, sex education among young people. I have with me, this is uh, Rebecca uh, Guevara of the Alpha Center. A pregnancy and a family resource center established in 2009. Uh, they work with women in crisis, mothers and children who are displaced, and provide teen risk avoidance programs, family research, and training. As I said, we are almost um, out of time on our program yes. this evening, but um, in the clo closing moments, I just want you to, um, to give some closing remarks um, on this very same subject matter. Uh, as it relates to our society here, Trinidad and Tobago, um, while we may, while it is important for us to look at what's happening in the region and the wider world, I believe we have to uh, be able to be in a position to craft our own uh, policies because, you know, because of our uniqueness. Um, give us, uh, you know, your closing remarks. Um, where should we be going now in Trinidad and Tobago and, and what are some of the, the critical um, areas that we should, maybe some of the low hanging fruits um, that we can approach going forward? So here's the thing, when it comes to our young people and healthy relationship formation and healthy family life, there are three things that young people need regardless. Safety, love and belonging and esteem. No matter what generation we're in or which decade we're in, these, this is unchanging. And if we are going to stabilize future families in Trinidad and Tobago, we have got to start with healthy relationship formation. And what is behind healthy relationship formation is a sexual risk avoidance or optimal youth health approach to helping them craft their future. You know, very quickly, I would just say there is a success sequence that based on research has been published that says if we teach our youths to um, focus on education, then on vacation, vocation or career income, then marriage, then children, the, 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 the likelihood of success goes up exponentially. If that sequence is followed in that order and to completion, meaning all stages, they, they will not fall into poverty. They will not fall. They, um, there is a saying that we have, live well, love well, and choose well. And if we can keep our, our young people um, or give them the best uh, option and not stoop to the soft bigotry of low expectations, we can build up a group of, uh, we can build up a, a generation of young people that would be able to form healthy relationships in the future, healthy marriages. We haven't, I mean, Stephen, this is for another time, but, yes. but, but the research shows that healthy marriages is one of the best things you could do for a country. Oh, and I'm sure that, you know, we can, we, can discuss, we can discuss more about, you know, on, yeah. on, on that subject matter, healthy marriages, yes. uh, which we can leave for another time. Mrs. Govai, I, I want to thank you so much for your time to sit with us uh, inside the Citizens Community Forum. It has been a pleasure uh, talking with you as um, we discuss uh, the issue of addressing issues that plague your family life and sex education among young people uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you so much again for taking the time to sit with us. Thanks for having me. Take care. Yeah. This is uh, Rebecca Ali Govaya there of the Elpis Center, a pregnant, pregnancy and a family resource center established in 2009, talking with us there on uh, addressing the issues that plague family life and sex education among young people. This is the Citizens Community Forum. I'm Stephen Cummings. See you next Wednesday. Bye. Came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. 
and then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Words there from famous poet Martin Nimelor, 1892-1984. Be part of the Citizens Community Forum, a place where we bring to light and discuss critical community, social and national issues, discussions on health, leadership, governance, crime, education and social justice. We, we might shift from focusing on whole language approaches to focusing on developing phonemic awareness. And so we're just teaching phonics and then the role of comprehension and the vocabulary development, making sure students can visualize when they read. We're not addressing those needs. So you're right. And, and as a matter of fact, I don't know, Stephen, if you know this, but there are some places in the States where the drinking age is, the legal drinking age is 21 and not 18. Even though there are persons advocating for our age of consent to be dropped back to 16. You are dealing with uh, yes. developmental stages of learning. Um, should it start at the primary, secondary, where should it start? Very, very good question. So there are studies that are being done. The thing about it, Mr. Cummins, let's be honest, how many people really sit and read those studies or mm. even, I mean, a lot of things are coming in different forms. A lot yeah. of the, the data, a lot of the research is coming in video forms and so on. In our own society, how has research been articulated on this pandemic? Every Wednesday, 8 to 9 p.m., the Citizens Community Forum, your host, Stephen Cummings.